conference. To protect the population, homeland and democracy is the first duty of government. And earlier this year, it published the Integrated Review of Security, Defence Development and Foreign Policy. This review set out a comprehensive approach to bolster our alliance and strengthen our capabilities. We are now joined by Defence Secretary Ben Wallace and his ministerial team to discuss how to implement this review, strengthen our armed forces, extend British influence whilst creating jobs across the UK. As ever, please do submit any questions that you may have via the conference app and join me in welcoming the defence team. everybody and uh, thank you for joining us all. This is the defence team. Uh, I am incredibly lucky as the defence secretary to be joined with a team that not only was untouched in the reshuffle but as a team of professionals, some of whom are veterans but also a team that is absolutely determined to deliver the agenda and I thought this was a great uh, opportunity as the defence secretary to introduce them to you all if you don't know them all but also to understand from them all the work they've done over the last two years. Because Defence has had a very great settlement from the Prime Minister. Defence is on track to redesign, reform and deliver uh, for the more anxious, insecure world that we all face. Uh, and Defence has been tested over the last year, as we've all seen. Uh, the men and women of our armed forces has done an amazing job in COVID. Right now, they are driving tankers up and down the United Kingdom. They stand by ready for all eventualities and at the same time they're deployed around the world protecting Britain's interests and her allies. And who could have missed the most amazing work they did at Op Pitting uh, in Afghanistan? An incredibly difficult uh, and dangerous task to bring out of Afghanistan those people that looked after our troops over many years. We brought them out uncertain though we were about the security situation and we got back a record number of people out of Afghanistan and are now we are resettling them into the United Kingdom. The work of 16 Air Assault Brigade and the commanders who led that uh, amazing airlift are, are something that show Britain at its best. I'm really lucky that I have a team that works well together. I've been a minister at all ranks in government over the years, uh, and I know how important it is that the ministers work together to deliver for a single agenda. Government is a team exercise, and if you're not interested in performing as a team, you frankly should go and sit on the back benches or not be part of a team. And you know, as a result, it's great that we not only get on well together, but we manage to trust each other and deliver a really good outcome. So I'm joined by uh, James Heapy, the Minister of the Armed Forces, himself a former veteran. Jeremy Quinn, my Minister of Defence Procurement, who has the eyes on the contracts and making sure we deliver for the equipment for the future. Leo Doherty who looks after the veterans and the personnel of our great armed forces, and Annabel Goldie up there on the screen, who is the guardian of our union, looks after the workforce's needs in the future uh, and makes sure that we all uh, stick together in, in making sure we keep people safe and, and our obligations towards both our MOD civil servants and indeed the health and safety that we owe the people who work in our organisation. So what I was going to do is we have a, a 20 minute session I was going to ask each of our ministers to explain what they've seen and done in the last year or two, and then we'll open up to questions and do our best to answer as many of your inquiries as possible. So, given we've literally come out of op pitting in Afghanistan, and indeed right now, as we speak, as I've said, we've got soldiers deployed in tankers, I thought if I ask James Heapy to discuss and reflect on what the armed forces personnel that he's in charge of operations have done over the last uh, 20 months, uh, and let's hear from James. Thank you, James. Um, thanks, Ben. And conference, can I start by just saying um, what a pleasure it is to work for a Secretary of State who brings the entire team 
on board uh, for, for his, instead of a speech there. This is reflective of the way Ben does his business in defence, and he is transforming our nation's defence because of that approach, and it is respected by military and civil service and his ministers, and I know from the plaudits he's won uh, over the summer that you too have recognised what a fantastic leader he is. Um, no, no. Uh, I've been asked to give you a rundown of everything the nation's armed forces have done in the last year in two minutes, and that's somewhat of a challenge, but I will do my best. Um, and I'm going to sort of go by continent slash region of the world. Uh, in, in Africa, the most significant development was that we began uh, a significant deployment uh, to Mali, where 250 members of the British Army joined an RAF detachment that had been uh, operating in Mali for some time as we increase our commitment in that part of the world as part of the UN peacekeeping mission. Um, beyond that, we are present elsewhere in West Africa, in Nigeria, Ghana, and training teams going in out of Gambia. We're increasingly committed in Kenya and Somalia. We do counter-illegal wildlife trade work uh, in Uganda, and we've got a new mission uh, starting soon in Mozambique. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy is just beginning uh, a period in the Gulf of Guinea, and that will become an annual activity as we contribute to counter piracy operations in those increasingly troubled waters. In the Asia Pacific, the headline thing has been the return of the UK's carrier strike capability uh, and the deployment to the Indo-Pacific, but that is not a flash in the pan. Last week, uh, I saw HMS Tamar and HMS Spey on their way towards the Panama Canal as they go to take permanent station in the Indo-Pacific over the years ahead, flying the flag and reassuring our allies. We've always had a presence in Brunei and Nepal, but increasingly our partnerships with India, Pakistan, Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand are important to defending the UK interest and uh, projecting UK power around the world. In South America and the, and the Caribbean, our work in Colombia continues to be hugely successful in interdicting drugs before they get to UK streets. We're supporting the overseas territories in the Turks and Caicos Islands and the Caymans, as well as our activities in Belize and Jamaica. HMS Wave Night, are it wrong? Uh, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Ship Wave Night. A tanker has this summer been busting drugs in the Caribbean as well as working with the US off Haiti in response to the earthquake there. And HMS Medway is permanently in the Caribbean on counter narcotics missions and uh, flying the flag for the UK amongst our allies. And that's before we even get to the extraordinary work that members of all three services do in the South Atlantic in protecting the Falkland Islands. In the Gulf, we continue to have ships committed to the mission to keep the Straits of Hormuz open, as well as the ongoing mission in Iraq. We have troops in Saudi Arabia, and we have a strong naval presence in Bahrain. And of course, you've seen, as Secretary of State rightly remarked, until very recently, we were in Afghanistan, and the performance of our troops in pitting, no matter what you think of the politics that went before or will come since, that was a truly extraordinary effort by the members of 16 Air Assault Brigade and the Royal Air Force. In the Euro-Atlantic, we've been busy in the Black Sea, the Barents Sea, the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as up in the High North. Our troops and the Royal Air Force are in the Baltic, the Balkans, and we've had air policing missions in Romania as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an extraordinary effort, but of course, beneath all of that, unnoticed and without fanfare, has been the extraordinary men and women who deliver our nuclear deterrent 365 days a year, the ultimate guarantor of our sovereignty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not just away from home that they've been successful. We've had the most amazing year doing homeland resilience as well. You've seen the effort that our armed forces have put into the vaccination program and the testing program and distributing PPE before that. But right now, they are driving fuel tankers. And back in January and December, they spent their Christmas swabbing the noses and throats of truckers so we could keep the port open. Ladies and gentlemen, in all corners of the earth and in all corners of the United Kingdom, our armed forces have had an amazing year. As the Minister of the Armed Forces, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to them all. Uh, thank you, James. Now, of course, without the right equipment and kit, we can't keep those men and women safe. We can't deploy them around the world. And so Jeremy has the onerous task of making sure we deliver highly complex equipment programs that keep a strategic edge uh, from our adversaries. Uh, and uh, so if we can hear from Jeremy what you've been doing, spending the money that we got uh, and how we're getting there. 
it's an extraordinary exciting moment. I think we all got that conference from the, from the intro we had right at the start. That £24 billion of additional money, that's extra investment into our armed forces. Now, that's money to keep us safe. It's money to meet the threat of the future. But we're very conscious of how much more we can get from that money to support our country in so many different ways, in supporting the skills and the jobs and the innovation that we need for the future. And that's why we set out in March in our defence and security industrial strategy how we're going to work with our international partners here in the UK to make the most out of that investment, to make certain it works for every bit of our country, supporting jobs, supporting skills, supporting innovation. And we're doing that in some traditional but still incredibly important aspects of defence uh, in shipbuilding. Uh, Ben's a shipbuilding czar amongst his other uh, commitments. We have an amazing uh, uh, pipeline of ships coming through to the Royal Navy than most they've had in, in decades. In aerospace, where our future combat uh, air system is taking forward uh, the future of air combat, uh, massive investment from the government, but backed up by investment from international partners and indeed uh, from industry. And other domains as well, as touched on in the introduction. Uh, domains like space, so important for the future. We stood up Space Command this summer. Uh, nuclear, James referred to it. We're investing in our nuclear deterrent to ensure it can continue to deter for the decades to come. And cyber, a new and vital domain, a fantastic announcement this week regarding our investment in cyber, a new headquarters for the future, and that's more money coming into levelling up, supporting the Lancashire mill towns, ensuring that we have the capabilities that we need, and we're investing in the skills of tomorrow. Underpinning it all is £6.6 .6 billion of commitment to defence, research and development. An incredibly important commitment. So with that extra investment and with that focus on R&D, I can guarantee that we'll be doing our bit on three vital tasks. Strengthening our union. The whole of this country benefits from defence in keeping us safe. It also benefits, all of it, from the economic benefit that flows from defence investment. Making certain that we are levelling up our country. I mentioned the cyber announcement. There are many others. Levelling up all parts of our country. And above all, making certain that we build that science, that technology superpower that this country deserves to be and which we need to be to keep us safe in the years ahead. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I'm going to segue your point on the union to Annabelle because our equipment programme, our spending, underpins that. And I'd like to hear from Annabelle, please, about how she sees uh, the procurement of ships, etc., playing in the union and the United Kingdom. Annabelle. It's uh, tremendously important, Ben, and um, can I say what a pleasure it is to be with you all, and it's an enormous pleasure to support you, Ben, in the terrific job that you're doing, and doing it not just for the UK globally, but of course right across the United Kingdom. And defence is one of these embodiments to me of what the Union is all about. We have armed forces personnel in every part of the UK. And yes, what Jeremy was talking about, much of our essential procurement is being done through industry partners across the United Kingdom. Um, significantly in Scotland, I was there this morning, uh, I was over at Recife visiting Babcock, where our Type 31 frigates are, we, are being built. I'm going off to Govan this week to see British Aerospace, where our Type 26 frigates are being built. Um, and what we managed to demonstrate through defence is that we are very much at the heart of what the union is. We benefit from the skills provided from all parts of the UK. We have armed forces personnel throughout the UK, and we are major investors um, in many of our communities in the different nations um, of the UK. And I think that is a vital uh, component of our success because part of the union is that we pool resource, we benefit from pulling that resource, and we provide mutual support. And every day I see that in action with defence. You know, James was talking about what we've done to help with COVID. That's been right across the United Kingdom, help to Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So in short, then, you know, to me, um, the union, the union working is demonstrated by what MOD and UK defence does within the union. I think that's great. Thank you, Annabelle. It's true. We are greater together than we are separated and... If you want to remind her of the SNP, the SNP had a chance to 
place a contract uh, for a ship in Scotland uh, only the other week. They actually own a yard, the Ferguson Yard, and they placed it in Romania. So uh, there's the SNP for you. Who needs, who needs enemies when you've got friends like that in the Scottish uh, government? So there we are. So now, of course, underpinning that is our care for the people who serve this country and what they do after it. And Leo has the very important task of looking after our veterans and making sure that this is the best place uh, to be a veteran. And uh, ask Leo, if you can, just reflect on, on both the consequences of Afghanistan, because that touched every single veteran here, and, and including people like James and yourself who had been in Afghanistan, yeah. there was a connection there that was been really important. Indeed. Indeed. Leo. Well, thank you, Secretary of State. And we are continuing, as you say, to strive to ensure that this is the best country in the world to be a veteran. And I'm very proud that this government has passed a number of very practical measures to positively impact the lives of veterans. We're putting the Armed Forces Covenant into law. We have passed the Overseas Operations Bill so that returning veterans don't face the scandal of legal pursuit. We've delivered the Veterans Rail Card, guaranteed job interviews for the civil service, Armed Forces champions in job centres who do brilliant work, tax breaks for those employing veterans, and a bespoke mental health care pathway in the NHS in the form of Op Courage, in which veterans themselves are involved. So there's been terrific progress. There is, of course, more to do. And our veteran strategy update, which we'll publish at the end of this year, will lay out how we're going to drive forward that agenda. And a key theme of that will be employability, celebrating and recognising the terrific contribution that veterans, some 15,000 service leavers every year, make in terms of their amazing skills bringing into the civilian workplace. And when it comes to serving personnel, that theme of skills is, is very relevant too, because everything we must do must be about ensuring those who serve have modern and relevant skills to be part of a battle-winning, highly innovative, sophisticated military that can win wars all around the world. And it's that skills agenda which we will deliver for them. But it's not just about serving people, it's also about their families. And we are putting service families at the heart of defence with things like wraparound childcare and support to spousal employment. And that's because we recognise that being in the military is not just about the individual, it's not just a job, it's more than a career, it's a way of life. And service families are absolutely critical to that. Thank you, Lee. And of course, the men and women of our armed forces are the only real asset at the heart of our defence. Without them, none of this is possible. And without a back office team, a team that supports us often unseen, uh, the ministers wouldn't be able to do their job in Parliament. And I'm delighted that we've got two new PPSs, James Sunderland and Suzanne Webb. James is a former officer in the Royal Logistic Corps, and Suzanne uh, is there to support us. And Alan Mack, our whip, who uh, makes sure that we all work to time, which hasn't really worked today so far, because we've, <laughs> we've slightly reduced a bit too much our time for questions. So look, I'm going to crack on uh, with the questions. I think, I think what I'd like to do is, there's a question that I think we could ask everyone uh, to uh, answer pretty quickly, which is, they all come in from somebody called Anonymous, so um, I hope that's not being hacked by the, <laughs> the Russians, haven't hacked that one right. So, um, you know, I, I think what's key, what one of them is, um, uh, let me give a look. What is your most enjoyable part of the job in the Defence Department? So, MOD, what's the most enjoyable part of your job, James? Seeing the pride that our men and women take representing the UK interests around the world. Last Wednesday evening, I was in Cartagena in Colombia on board HMS Spey, and young men and women recruited from all corners of the UK were wearing their smartest white uniform, hosting Colombian dignitaries, representing the UK interest. Didn't matter whether they were able seamen at 18 years old or the commander of the ship, they all deeply believed in reflecting what the UK stands for, and we should be proud of them all. Annabelle. It's been part of a, a great team, and I'm not just being psychophantic to um, my, my pals who are with you down there, Ben. I do think we're a good team, and I think that means that we, we actually are making a difference. Um, I was delighted that we were all left to work together. I think we, we have a synergy. And James is absolutely right. For me, it's people. It's people within our armed forces. It's a tremendously talented civil servants who support us. Um, and it's that sense of pride when you see our people delivering on the job. James has seen it. I saw it on Saturday. I was there for the 21 gun salute for the Queen at Edinburgh Castle, speaking to our gunnery crew. We'd come up from Catrick. There they were in Edinburgh Castle, um, delivering the salute and telling me about how they'd responded to MACA requests in Manchester. 
doing it with smiles on their faces, doing it with pride in their faces. By golly, what a privilege. What a privilege to be part of all of that. Great, thank you. Now, I'm going to ask one question for Leo. Leo, some, uh, Zach Moody asked, how can we bring more people into the armed forces uh, as it almost only ever gets smaller? Are we still able to protect our country? So I think we, we, we will bring more people into the armed forces. And if we uh, communicate the fact that it's still an amazing career and all the more relevant than ever before. So I think the, the veterans of the future and those young people coming into the armed forces, they will be gaining skills are, that are absolutely at the heart of our national response to the huge geostrategic challenges of our time, whether it be cyber or space or whatever. So it's a great career. It's great to serve. You leave service, military service, as a better person. You'll get a great job afterwards. And, and, we're, and the nation will be proud of you. So come and serve and join up. Great. And Jeremy, last question. Our military does a wonderful job and are the best in the world. How focused are our armed forces on cyber threats and how are we going to meet them? Uh, incredibly focused. So uh, there is a... There is a wide appreciation right the way across the top of our armed forces that is not just the traditional domains we need to keep an eye on. Just look at what our adversaries are doing in cyber and in space. We need to be on top of that game too. So there is a huge amount of focus on it. As I said, we've set up Space Command uh, this summer. But we also announced only this week billions of pounds investment, over five billion pounds of investment in our new national cyber HQ based up in the Lancashire mill towns. There'll be thousands of people coming into employment there, skilled people who can really undertake that task and be able to not only defend the United Kingdom and our interests, but look after our allies across NATO as well. We are known throughout the world for our skills in, in uh, cyber and we are going to invest in it and we're going to continue to make certain that we are a force for good in that incredibly important domain. Great, Jeremy. Well, the best part of the job for me was things like yesterday. I went up to near Bolton and Burnley and we announced £5.5 billion of investment into a national cyber force that will employ over 3,000 people by 2030, nestled between Blackburn and Burnley and Preston and Chorley, levelling up, delivering new skills for our young people. We're going to, the hackers of the future, the computer exploiters of the future, the people that will keep us safe from servers a long way away, uh, and it was a meeting with the FE colleges, the HE colleges, and the schools, and recognising that the world changes, and we're going to change with it. And this government mm. has invested in defence so it can change with the threats. And that's what we're rolling out. That's the best part of the job. And the best part of the job is being able to do it in the here and now. Right now, all the team, all the ministers, and the Prime Minister are right behind us in making sure that we keep Britain and her allies safe. And that's something I'm proud of something that I think the whole Conservative Party should be proud of because we mean what we say and we fund it. We don't just talk like the Labour Party about things, putting on ties. And I think they said, uh, they advised people to look patriotic or something in one of their recent bulletins. <laughs> but we know, below the bonnet, we actually do as we say, put the money in and grow British industry and skills yeah. and invest in the men and women of the armed forces. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming to this session. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Well, well.